As people around New England find contaminants in their drinking water, states are taking a stand. Everyone has an equal opportunity to have lead-free drinking water within a time frame that uh, is reasonable. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. We'll discuss clean water issues in our region, and we'll explore a new study that shows home values around New England are eroding because of rising seas. Plus, as the Patriots go to the Super Bowl, again, we'll look into the history of the team. For lots of Patriots fans, that once-in-a-lifetime thing has already happened twice in the past two seasons or, you know, a number of times over the past decades. Finally, fun on the ice takes many forms. I haven't caught anything yet, but still hopeful. This is just a waiting game. You know, you play with the rod a little bit, bounce it up and down, and uh, hope a fish bites. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative. Eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm John Dankosky. Thanks for joining us. We've been exploring the impact of climate change in our region as it affects everything from farms to fish. But one of the biggest challenges is on the coast as waters rise. New polling shows that people are increasingly concerned about this threat, but sometimes it's a pocketbook issue that really focuses the mind. There's a new report from First Street Foundation that found that between 2005 and 2017, homes in New England have lost over $400 million in value because of rising seas, with the threat of even more erosion in value as waters rise higher. Yeah, that'll get attention. We call Jeremy Porter, a co-author of this study. He is an academic data consultant for First Street Foundation. He's also a professor of sociology at City University of New York and a lecturer at Columbia University's Environmental Health Sciences Program. Jeremy, welcome to Next. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, why don't you tell us first broadly what you found in this study? Sure. Um, so this, this is just an extension of other research we've done. We've, we've modeled over 14 states now along the eastern seaboard and in the Gulf Coast. In the New England region, we found that about $403 million in relative home value had been lost between 2005 and 2017, and about half of that was in the state of Massachusetts. Talk more about what you mean by the erosion of home values. How do you calculate this? Sure. So we, we, there are two parts to our analysis. First, we use observed tide gauge data over the last 30 years to understand how high the water has been on a daily basis, and then we extract that information to understand the water levels we end up comparing that to the elevation of an area. Once we do that, we're able to understand where water is on an average high tide or even on a king tide. And when we compare those king tide numbers to properties, we're able to understand the amount of the property that gets inundated by tidal flooding and how that's been increasing over time. And then we used all real estate transactions since 2005. So we have all of the real market observed real estate transactions that we can observe then the relationship between increased tidal flooding over our time period and the erosion of property values for homes that are at risk of tidal flooding and have experienced tidal flooding in the past. So just to be clear, we're talking about homes where the tides may come up and actually inundate homes or encroach on the property somewhat. Not necessarily all the homes that are in, say, a seaside community may be set back a little bit off the beach. There are two inputs that are driving this relative appreciation loss. One is the property itself being flooded and one is the community starting to develop a reputation as a, uh, a neighborhood maybe that experiences tidal flooding because of the highly visible uh, phenomenon of road flooding. Ah, so, so it's uh, a community reputational risk. It might be a place that easily floods and therefore it's going to drive down home prices in that town. We saw from academic research but also from media reports that there's been, an in- there's been a lot of increased attention relative to tidal flooding events and the increase of what are called nuisance tidal flooding events since 2005. So it's something that is increasing in terms of observed uh, occurrences, but it's also increasing in terms of awareness, and people are starting to respond to that. Peter Biello from New Hampshire Public Radio spoke with John Rice. He's a real estate broker in Rye, New Hampshire, who also serves as the chief statistician on the Seacoast Board of Realtors in that state. He described how he's seen property values impacted by the changing coast. I've seen it all over the place. I was thinking of one property on Ocean Boulevard in Rye. And I've been in real estate 44 years. I used to be a licensed appraiser. So I felt the value of this house was around 800, maybe high sevens. But with flood insurance laws that changed, 
a potential buyer would have to come in and lift it up three feet to allow water to go underneath it and to uh, move up all of the utilities to the first floor. So when this was done, of course, this has changed the complexion of the value of the property, and it ended up selling for high five when it could have sold and should have sold in the high seven. So again, that's a real estate broker in New Hampshire speaking with NHPR. What he's saying basically is a house valued in the high $700,000 sells for about $500,000. Is this similar to what you're seeing elsewhere? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's sort of sneaky in the sense that um, over the last decade, especially the latter part of the last decade, home values on, in general are increasing. So we've seen absolute increases in home values overall because the market's been strong. But we're, what we're talking about here is a lack of appreciation for homes that flood versus homes that don't flood. And those homes that are right on the coast that require that, that type of property level adaptation, like raising the home or building some type of a small barrier wall to keep the water off the property, those are the types of homes where um, when buyers see that they're going to have to put this type of money into the property, they're, act, they're asking for that money to be deducted from the sale price. I'm wondering, though, as you see some communities taking a more proactive and more holistic approach, really trying to retreat from the shoreline as as a unit, as opposed to one property rising up versus another property rising up. I'm wondering if, if there's any instances you found in your studies about communities that have been able to mitigate some of these problems by doing better planning, by figuring out different ways to deal with the rising tides in, in their communities. There's lots and lots of examples of, of communities that are starting to put a lot of effort into adaptation. And adaptation is a way um, to stop the current levels of sea, the, the current tidal levels from, from inundating the roads and inundating the properties and the communities. Lots of those things revolve around things like um, parks or empty green spaces that are, are designed to collect water, the development of seawalls or the development of some type of a barrier to catch the water the introduction of backflow preventers and sewer systems so that water's not coming back up through the sewer system when the tides get high. So there's lots of those different uh, measures that people, that cities are, are, are implementing. Um, some, there are some cities that are actually, as you mentioned before, as a community, are, are, are actually moving away from the coast. So it's, uh, it, there's both adaptation and sort of larger scale retreat operations that are taking place. As you try to tell the story about what rising seas might mean to us here in America along the seacoast of New England or really anywhere along the Atlantic Ocean, it seems as though you you may have stumbled, Jeremy, on something that might perk up people's ears. Uh, A lot of times people don't really pay much attention when you're talking about climate change and its impact on some obscure thing that they might not think about. But when it comes to property values, all of a sudden people might start to, I think about it a little bit more. Is, Is that part of your goal? Right. Yeah. So I started this work with my co-author, uh, Stephen McAlpine, who we published the first paper in the Miami-Dade area. And we were, we were interested in the fact that most of the research in this area is forward-facing. And it's fairly crude in the sense that it's saying when sea levels rise one foot, two feet, three feet, this is going to be the impact. But we were seeing all these media reports and these, uh, this other research that had said that the media are responding already to, um, and people are already responding to, uh, increases in sea level rise and increases in tidal flooding. So we were we wanted to to figure out why it's not a more uh, well known phenomenon and people aren't aren't sort of talking about this more. So we went and got the actual observed real estate transactions because we thought that if we can show with observed data we can actually find the trend using these economic pricing models that all of a sudden people would perk up and they say, Oh, it's my home. My home is losing this, my home is being impacted this way then it, it sort of gets people's attention that may have thought that it was a maybe a city or a town issue is actually an individual level issue. They're actually losing property value because of it. It essentially became a way to effectively communicate um, sea level rise to people in a way that hasn't been done so. Jeremy Porter is an academic data consultant for First Street Foundation, also a professor of sociology at City University of New York, and a lecturer at Columbia University's Environmental Health Sciences Program. Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. I really appreciate it. That report outlined some of the communities that are seeing the biggest loss in home values around our region. Places like Salisbury, Mass., Warwick, Rhode Island, and Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. In Maine, the biggest loss in home value was in the city of Bath. First Street Foundation estimates that homes in the town lost over $4 million due to sea level rise. So we called Ben Averill. He's Bath's city planner. He started by describing his town. Bath is a city of um, about 8,000 people. We are on the 
um, what we call the coast of Maine, um, even though technically we're an inland community. So um, we're about eight miles up the Kennebec River. So we're about eight miles from the ocean. It's a saltwater river. And we are just about 40 minutes north of Portland, Maine. How have you seen sea level rise affecting the city? Talk about some of the impacts that maybe residents can can see with their own eyes. Well, because we are on a tidal river, um, sea level rise for our community is a little bit different than um, a community that is directly on the ocean. Our impacts tend to be almost specifically with the tides. Um, We've noticed more impacts on king tides and other high tide events that also have storm surge events or or other larger water impact events. What are you doing to help uh, mitigate against these problems? We have been a part of several different studies over the last five or seven years focused on sea level rise or different types of um, adaptation measures. The city has worked proactively to try to combat some of that. We have a climate action plan that um, was written in 2007 Um, and is being actually updated as we speak. So that action plan is going to include portions of resiliency related to sea level rise. We also have been working to try to procure some land along the river to try to mitigate some of the damages to businesses and um, homes right along the river. Ben Averill is city planner for Bath, Maine. Ben, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on as well. We've got links to that study and a lot more climate change coverage at nextnewengland.org. New England's coastal communities have seen decades of rising property values, followed by this climate change-related decline. But many inland communities have struggled for decades following another big shift, the loss of manufacturing jobs. New Hampshire Public Radio's Robert Garova takes us to Franklin, a town that's one of the smallest and poorest in the Granite State. Even with a booming state economy, Franklin has remained a city in transition, always seemingly one major project away from revitalization. But as Robert reports, some residents think Franklin has to deal with its present before it can look to the future. It's a cold November morning, and Todd Workman is giving me the grand tour of Franklin's main drag. But we take a space that wasn't a restaurant to make into a restaurant. You yeah. heating, AC, plumbing, it's a, it's a, big, it's a big expense, yeah. but you need gathering places. With the zeal of a kid who's just built their first city out of Legos, Workman weaves in and out of partially vacant old brick buildings. He shows off restored tent ceilings, Art Deco architectural details. This place has a salvaged bar for what he hopes will soon be a restaurant. He gestures to the window in the corner. Bands in there, so at the traffic light you can see some bands playing. But this is the direction we're headed. We need lots of gathering places. Workman has a lot of big ideas for this little city, and he's poured more than a million dollars into buying real estate for redevelopment projects. Since 2015, Workman, through his nonprofit, has brought new investment from local banks. He helped coordinate the redevelopment of the Franklin Light and Power Company building into 45 low-income units. Workman, who grew up a town over in Guilford, says he wants to see the once industrial city of Franklin have a new life, one that's centered around the river. You know, the mills were Act One. What's Act Two? For Workmen, a major part of Act Two for Franklin will be staged right here on the Winnipesaukee River. Workmen and others envision what's called a white water park, a recreational water feature for kayakers that takes advantage of Franklin's location at the convergence of three rivers. So we can build our town around the white water park. We already have fifteen to 18,000 cars a day go through here, but no reason to stop. Just up the street at a small diner, owner Kathy Hubble, midway through a busy breakfast rush, says there might be a better way to go about rethinking the city. She welcomes the redevelopment, but she's not sure it's the best first step. Maybe they have to start from the bottom and work their way up. Maybe instead of starting all these new projects, we can fix what's wrong first. But I think that there's a lot of denial in Franklin. Hubble and others I spoke with would like to see Franklin focus on the problems it already has before moving to notions of new restaurants and white water parks. Franklin has a stagnating population of around 8,500 people, with close to 20 percent living below the poverty line. Last year, Franklin also struggled with a school funding crisis. And Hubble points out what she sees as another issue facing the city. Some people in the city are in denial that we have a homeless problem. They're saying that we don't have homeless, but we do. Hubble says she has compassion for homeless people in the area. At one time, she was without a place to live and knows how it feels. 
but she encounters many people struggling with addiction who she says have stolen from her or disturbed customers in her restaurant. She's even cut back the hour she's open because she says she doesn't feel safe at times. I ask her if things keep on the way they are. Will she be in Franklin in a year? No, I'll, I'll leave. Just a few doors over, Desiree Dominguez McLaughlin runs the laundromat in town. The place has become more of a community center, though, with a play area for children and a small library. She says she's seen a lot of change in the 13 years or so she's worked here. Since we opened, we've noticed a spike in homelessness when the opioid crisis really first began. Last year, McLaughlin and others in Franklin began to feel restless about the homelessness and drug issues facing the city. Many in Franklin began referring to an area frequented by homeless people, a stone's throw from downtown, as Heroin Hill. So I started uh, a Facebook event that just said, we're going up the hill. And I, I'm so glad we did that because it really did open a lot of avenues for me. It raised awareness. McLaughlin, along with about 20 other residents and local police, visited the encampment to check on people. She also reached out to local churches and charities to see what could be done to help. McLaughlin says she likes that Todd Workman and others are trying to bring new life to Franklin. But it's not something everyone can take part in right now. There are a lot of people who do not have even access to that kind of a vision. They're trying to get up in the morning, get their kids on the bus, go to their job, um, and then probably go to their other job. McLaughlin says she sees the working class reality in Franklin on a daily basis. And she's also well aware of how the forces of gentrification can leave them out. It's going to happen anyways. There's a movement moving forward. Started in Boston and it's coming up this way. Back at Workman's nonprofit headquarters, he says he believes his approach will work for the city. That a more prosperous Franklin can bring relief by way of increased tax revenue and more funding for schools. You know, the homeless population, the opioid crisis, and making sure that we have quality school system, you know, all those things are really important. Um, we have to stick within our skill set. I mean, we're here as a nonprofit um, catalytic downtown development organization, so I'm not versed. I don't have the answers for some of those questions. It's not my area of knowledge and expertise. Meanwhile, other investors are willing to make a bet that the state's smallest city can attract new residents who are willing to pay market rate rents. In December 2017, Chinberg Properties, a developer which owns several properties throughout the state, closed on downtown Franklin's largest piece of real estate. The 186,000-square-foot J.P. Stevens Mill is said to be converted into 125 loft-style units right on the river. Workman says this project is key to Franklin's success. I mean, it's going to take another two or three years before it comes together, but this isn't um, speculation anymore. It's not a dream. It's not a concept. It's all here, all the building blocks, the players, the funding is working its way through. Workman believes things will get better for Franklin, and he says he's not alone in his efforts, with other nonprofits, officials, and business owners working to re-envision the place. Until then, the hope is that people will pay attention to the undercurrent of prosperity in the Three Rivers City. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Robert Garova. Coming up, the Patriots are back in the Super Bowl again. But longtime fans still remember the days before the dynasty. But first, more contaminants are being found in New England drinking water. We'll look at what states are doing next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and global warming. After lead was found in the water at 16 Vermont schools, Vermont's Department of Health pledged to test the drinking water in every school for lead by the end of this year. In New Hampshire, that state's proposing new limits on the amount of toxic PFAS chemicals in public water systems. That's an environmental fix that could cost the state millions to implement. And just this week, Vermont reached a deal with St. Cobain, a chemical maker that has operated in both Vermont and New Hampshire, to deliver water to homes and businesses that have been affected by PFOA contamination of their wells. These stories are just part of an ongoing trend, greater concern about the quality of our region's water, tied to old infrastructure and manufacturing. Joining us to talk about these issues in Vermont is Howard Weiss-Tisman. He's a reporter for Southern Vermont and the Connecticut River Valley for VPR. 
Howard, welcome back to Next. All right. Hi. Thank you, John. Also with us is Annie Ropeek. She's a reporter for NHPR who focuses on energy and the environment. Annie, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Howard, we're going to start with you. Vermont's Department of Health announced it's going to test all of Vermont's schools for lead before the end of this year. Tell us a bit more about what's going on. Yeah, well, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, uh, shined a light on this issue. And over the past few years, uh, more and more states have been testing water in schools for lead. So about a year ago, Vermont decided to run a pilot study, as you said, to kind of see what was out there. The state tested 16 schools and five of the schools had lead in the water above the EPA action level and required immediate action. Uh, Every one of the schools had a little bit of lead. And so... It took a little time for the Scott administration to put together a plan to figure out what was next. The administration said it could take up to three years to test every school, and a lot of people thought that was way too long to wait. So when the legislature came back in January, they got right down to writing a bill requiring every school to test. And then the governor gave his budget address last week, and he said he wanted to find the money to test the schools as soon as possible. Now, the water has to be tested under normal circumstances when the kids are using the water. And the governor's health commissioner, Mark Levine, last week said he hoped to start during this school year. And uh, this is a little bit what he said. We envision this program, including all of the schools in Vermont, and everyone has an equal opportunity to have lead-free drinking water within a time frame that uh, is reasonable. Now, these lead tests, they're not expensive or complicated to carry out, but it's going to take some coordination to gather, you know, these tens of thousands of results from all of Vermont schools and make sure the data is accurate. Levine said the state's labs are gearing up, and he said the state could hire more staff or have some of the testing done out of state, but they want to get this done right away. Howard, where's the lead coming from? Is it old pipes in the school? Is it old pipes throughout the infrastructure of Vermont's drinking water system? Yeah, it's a little bit of old pipes. Um, Lead was used in pipes right up through the 50s, but it was allowed to be used in solder right up through 1988. So, of course, Vermont has a lot of old school buildings. And that's part of the problem here is that lead is tested at municipal water systems uh, regularly. But even if the water is clean when it's coming into the school, it can be sitting in these pipes overnight. And what really what people are concerned about is that first shot of water in the morning could really have some very high levels for the kids. So the state's trying to uh, figure out what's out there. So, Annie, how does this commitment in Vermont to testing schools for lead and drinking water, how does it compare to what's happening in New Hampshire right now? So we have some schools where lead has been found in the water, too. There was a handful of Manchester City schools where lead turned up at certain drinking fountains um, last year. So New Hampshire has a law going into effect this July that passed last year that will require those schools, all schools, to test all the faucets where water is available to kids for lead. And if they find a certain level, they have to shut those pipes down and remediate whatever's causing the problem immediately. Um, And the law is, it's it's multi-pronged. It also makes it so parents have to opt out of getting their kids tested for lead poisoning at the pediatrician at an early age. So it kind of makes that the default. Uh, And it also gives landlords more resources to get rid of lead paint. So the state is really looking for this on a number of fronts. But I think a lot of advocates are really looking for schools to start complying with their part of the law as quickly as possible, knowing that this is going to be expensive. There's definitely going to be problems that turn up that people don't know about now. uh, And uh, we're going to see that beginning this year. And we know that this is such a big problem because lead is seen to be a much bigger health risk for young people than it is for older people. Howard, what can you tell us about how much lead is considered safe in the drinking water in the state of Vermont? So this is one of the big issues that's being debated right now in the state house in Vermont. Right now, Vermont uses 15 parts per billion. That's the EPA action level. But most health officials agree that that's way too high. Um, As you said, lead's really dangerous, especially for young kids. 
And I was at a hearing in the Senate Education Committee last week, and Middlebury College professor Molly Costanza Robinson was there. Uh, She's done a lot of work testing water for lead, and she told the Senate Ed Committee that Vermont has to reconsider that 15 parts per billion number. This is what she said. The one part per billion level, um, the first safety level was put out by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and that's the right level if you're worried about health. Um, But the other, the EPA action level at 15 parts per billion, the FDA limit for bottled water of five parts per billion, those are not health-based standards. So at some point in the next few weeks, this bill will come together in the Vermont legislature, and they're going to have to decide on something probably between two to five parts per billion. And of course, it's going to have some really big repercussions because this is what's going to direct the school's to the remediation they're going to have to take on. And as I said in the pilot study, most of the schools had traces of lead. So if the state goes down as low as two to five parts per billion, there's going to be a lot of work to do. So, Howard, before we close the loop on lead here, there's new legislation, there's new standards potentially coming. What happens after all this? It sounds as though if Vermont changes the limits and looks at this more closely, it could cost schools an awful lot of money to retrofit and make sure that the drinking water's safe. Well, right. And that's the other big issue right now is who's going to pay for this and where the money's going to come from. Um, As I said, the Senate Ed Committee is just putting this bill together. There's a couple of ideas being floated. I spoke to the committee chairman. He said the state might put together a matching fund. I think that there is some federal funding available for some of this cleanup. But this could potentially cost a lot of money. Um, Right now, the health experts, the um, education people, they want to test the schools. And then we're going to figure out from there what's going to happen next as far as who's going to pay for it. So, And I would also just add that in New Hampshire, funding is a really big open question for some of these remediation issues. The state has a drinking and groundwater trust fund, and uh, the legislature is taking some steps this year to look at how sustainable that is, about ways to maybe expand it. And lead is not the only sort of unfunded drinking water mandate we have coming uh, in the state this year. We're we're going to talk about uh, PFAS chemicals in a second, but we're also looking at cutting our arsenic standard in half. We would only be the second state to do that, to go in half from the federal standard. New Jersey is the other state. Uh, We have a lot of arsenic in our groundwater in northern New England. We drink a lot of well water, and it's been tied to some of our high cancer rates. And so that's another thing that the state is looking at doing that will pass costs on to water systems and schools and potentially even homeowners that they're going to need to find money to deal with somehow. And it's not entirely clear yet where that's all going to come from. So chemicals like lead and arsenic have long been in the groundwater supplies in places like New England, but there's a new class of chemicals, at least new over the course of the last couple decades, called PFAS, and you're finding them in Vermont and in New Hampshire. Annie, maybe you can remind us first what PFAS chemicals are and why they're unsafe to drink. Yeah, so this stands for per- and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Uh, It's this class, really, of thousands of different man-made chemicals that were used for decades uh, in all kinds of products, household and industrial products that I I think of as as anything that really resists something, so like stains or grease or water or heat, Uh, take older Teflon pans or stain-proof carpets, Gore-Tex jackets, uh, fire retardant foams. All of those have been sources of PFAS in the environment. And really, these chemicals are out there in the water, potentially in the soil and air, and they are all in our blood at some level. That's been confirmed. And so the research is really around how much PFAS uh, will be linked to health problems. Some studies have linked these chemicals to impaired kidney and liver function, to high cholesterol, uh, developmental issues, reproductive issues, immune issues, potentially even some cancers. It's a huge, huge problem. And policymakers and scientists are really only just beginning to get their arms around it. And much like the debate, Annie, over lead, there's a question of how much exactly is safe. There are standards that have been set by government agencies over the course of time, but many health experts say that those levels aren't anywhere near close to providing a health benefit to people. What what levels right now of PFAS chemicals are safe, according to the government, in drinking water? 
Yeah, that's the million dollar question. So the EPA and states like New Hampshire have focused on a level of 70 parts per trillion for certain ones of these chemicals, uh, which is much higher than some advocates would like to see. They point to advice from the Centers for Disease Control, which has recommended using levels 10 or 15 times lower than that as a starting point to begin looking for potential health problems. Um, And there are just challenges in squaring all those different studies And the health effects of the different PFAS chemicals and turning those into useful laws is just a really, really big challenge. I talked recently to Jonathan Ali. He's a state toxicologist in New Hampshire. And he says it's not just that there are so many of these chemicals or that they're so ubiquitous. It's also that they don't break down in the environment or in our bodies. Biologically, we are terrible about getting these things out of our body. If you look at other animals, and I'm not even just saying like small animals get it out faster. I mean, you look at cows, they get it out in a few months. Why, why does it take us so much more time? That is a fascinating question and one of those research gaps. He also says the different chemicals all do slightly different things in different parts of your body, like different amounts and times. And scientists just haven't had the time yet. These are such new chemicals that we don't have the technology or the resources. um, And we just haven't had the time to figure out how they all interact with each other or exactly what they all have in common. We have sort of general assumptions, but it's not enough to make hard regulations on. And that's why we see debate among government science and academic science and states on what really is a safe level. Now, Howard, in Vermont, they have approached the issue of PFAS levels in drinking water a bit differently than New Hampshire, right? Vermont is setting a drinking water standard for PFAS chemicals. And what this is going to do, this is going to require municipal water systems to test for the PFAS chemicals. And it puts the chemicals right along the same line of lead and arsenic and all of the other contaminants that any municipal water system Test for. So, this policy is just going through the rulemaking phase. The Department of Environmental Conservation hopes that this happens quickly, but there's a good chance at some point um, during this year, Vermont is going to start testing all of its water for PFAS. So, we've been seeing problems with the water in New England for years, and it seems as though more problems are cropping up. Howard, I I mentioned old infrastructure at the top of our interview. I guess I'm wondering, what what are the reasons people are looking at? Why is this such a problem across New England right now? It's not just happening in, in New England. The lead issue is in Michigan. It's happening across the country. And the PFAS contamination as well, anywhere where there's an air base, people see it. Um, In a lot of places where it was manufactured. And so what I think we're seeing in New England as far as the PFAS chemicals go is it's a legacy of our small industrial companies that were kind of peppered around New England. And these chemicals were used in wire coatings, as Annie said, in all sorts of manufacturing. So what we're seeing is that these old factories where this stuff was used is leaching into the groundwater. So it's really interesting that Howard mentions our industrial legacy up here. I really think that's sort of the unifying feature of all of these things. I mean, we are living at a time now where we are several decades out from sort of the beginning of real environmental regulation, right, and real awareness that these things happen, you know, that if you're making lead in a factory or if you're making, you know, industrial coatings in a factory, that that stuff has the potential to get out into the environment and to make people sick and that that's something the government can take a responsibility over. Um, and we're, we're in that moment now, you know, and so lead was in our pipes and our cars and our gasoline for a long time. And now we're having to deal with that. And PFAS is the same thing. We've just found out about it more recently. And I think the other unifying feature of this problem is funding. You know, there's not a lot of money out there to upgrade water infrastructure and to do this kind of testing and treatment. There's not a lot of money for homeowners who want to install filters on their taps and on their wells. And all of that same outdated infrastructure and reliance on groundwater and all of that is is what's made lead and arsenic such a problem here. It's what's exacerbated the PFAS problem. And it's what's making this such a challenge for regulators to deal with, because even if they can get potentially sound policies into place, there still may not be funding to carry those policies out in a timely manner. Annie Ropeek covers energy and environment for NHPR. Howard Weiss-Tisman covers southern Vermont and the Connecticut River Valley for VPR. Thank you both for joining us. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, John. Thank you. Coming up, we'll talk about the Patriots and we'll go out ice fishing. It's next. (music) 
Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate and clean energy. Well, ho-hum, the New England Patriots are headed to the Super Bowl again. If they win, it would be the team's sixth championship since 2001, and that would tie the record for most Super Bowl wins. It could make them the greatest dynasty in NFL history. But it wasn't always that way. We thought we should take a look back at the history of New England's football team. And here with us is Mike Stanton. He's an associate professor of journalism at the University of Connecticut and a longtime sports writer and investigative journalist for the Providence Journal. Mike, welcome back to Next. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. So I guess my first question is, Mike, when did people in New England really, really start to care about the Patriots? Because when I moved to the city of Boston in around 1990, Mm -hmm. no one really cared about the Patriots. Then all of a sudden, there were a lot of people on that bandwagon. John, just to put it in perspective, do you realize that there are babies born within the last 11 months in New England who have never seen their Patriots in a Super Bowl? (laughs) And they're going to realize their dream is going to come true this weekend. So um, it's a long time between feedings, you know, for yeah. Patriots fans. I mean, when you go back, you know, they were like the, the orphan of the, uh, you know, second league, the American Football League in the 1960s. I think they made it to one championship game and they lost 51 to three or something. Um, they played in uh, Nickerson Field in Harvard Stadium in Fenway Park at BU's Alumni Stadium. Um, and then they went to Foxborough, where they initially played in the old uh, Schaefer Stadium, where drunks would be stumbling down the uh, the wooden bleachers. I remember going to a playoff game there. Of course, they lost. Um, and then when they finally did make it to a Super Bowl in 1985, we all gathered around our TV sets with anticipation and watch the Chicago Bears steamroller them 46 to 10. Well, the New England Patriots have this regional moniker, even though they started as the Boston Patriots, and Mm -hmm. they represent in some ways uh, all of New England. But before we get to the story about how they almost came to Hartford, Mm -hmm. perhaps you can put this in a little bit of context for us, Mike. I mean, there there wasn't a football team, a professional football team, in New England at all before the Patriots came to join the AFL. So an awful lot of people in this region, they already had allegiances. This isn't necessarily Patriots country, all of New England, right? No, it's big New York Giants territory. You still find quite a few uh, Giants fans here. I grew up in outside of Hartford in Windsor Locks and a lot of Giants fans there. And even when the Patriots, you know, came into the NFL, they were um, in the early 1970s, they were kind of a joke and not a team that had a lot of allegiance. In fact, when they finally moved out of their, you know, homeless situation in Boston and went to Foxborough, they wanted to call themselves the Bay State Patriots. And the NFL nixed that idea for brand recognition, and they became the New England Patriots. So the New England Patriots, back in 1998, Mm -hmm. they start to negotiate with the state of Connecticut about moving from Foxborough to the downtown area of Hartford, which at the time was trying to rebuild itself, a revitalization that was being headed up by Governor John Rowland, who just a few years later would end up in prison on unrelated corruption charges. But he negotiated with the Crafts. And I remember, Mike, I was at a press conference. It's about 20 years ago right now Mm -hmm. in which uh, Robert Kraft and John Rowland said the Patriots are coming to Hartford. And there was a lot of enthusiasm. As a matter of fact, we found this clip. Here's Jonathan Kraft. Uh, He's Robert Kraft's son, current president of the Patriots, uh, talking to Eyewitness News in Connecticut in December of 1998 about the planned move uh, here to the city. You're going to have tens of thousands of people, not just for football, but for the concerts and the soccer and all the other events, coming from all over New England to Hartford, experiencing its rejuvenation, spending money in the city, spending the night at hotels and restaurants and eating. So it really should be a win for the Connecticut citizens, uh, both being able to come to the facility, but also from an economic standpoint as well. All right, so these are the promises being made far beyond just a football team playing eight or ten times a year. What what ended up happening with the with the Patriots coming and and moving themselves to downtown Hartford? Well, John, there's another great Connecticut promoter named P.T. Barnum, and he <laughs> said there's a sucker born every minute. Yeah. And a lot of people felt that even at the the peak of the excitement in Hartford, that it was just never going to happen. That Robert Kraft was basically using Hartford as a tool 
to get what he wanted out of Massachusetts, which is what he has today, this beautiful Gillette Stadium, this uh, surrounding uh, lucrative mall, the Patriot Place. And uh, I remember at the height of it, uh, Dan Shaughnessy, the Boston Globe columnist, sports columnist, you know, said this is never going to happen. The NFL is never going to let the Patriots get away from the bigger Boston market. And uh, and Shaughnessy was kind of belittling Hartford as the insurance capital, a dull city. And I remember vividly he called it America's file cabinet. <laughs> and, and and I think Hartford was kind of played for suckers there. They they were in many ways, and I think it, it also set off some bad feelings in part of the New England region uh, about this team. But still, there are there are an awful lot of fans across Connecticut, certainly in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Do, do you sense that the New England Patriots are now New England's team, that there are fans all across our region? Totally, totally. And just as New England has politically become isolated from the rest of the country, um, in terms of uh, pigskin politics, we're also isolated because... I think if you go outside of New England, uh, the the Patriots are kind of like the old New York Yankees, um, the hated villain, the Death Star somebody compared them to a few years ago. Because this dynasty might be at its end, because Tom Brady can't play forever, Bill Belichick probably can't coach forever, if the Patriots start to perform more like a, a normal football team or maybe even start to lose, do you think that they will hold the imagination of New England in the way that they have? Have they built up so much goodwill that they'll always be a team that people uh, people follow here? Or do you sense that New England fans, once they start losing someday down the line, might not be going to the stadium quite as much as they used to? Excellent question. I, I think that, you know, maybe the Patriots through this dynasty, they've built up the kind of, uh, you know, fan base that the Red Sox have had through their lean years. And certainly attendance isn't going to be as strong when you're not winning. But I think they've probably built a reservoir of interest in the team. And then obviously it will depend on who who leads them in the future. But one, one of the interesting things I think about this dynasty, um, when you look at it, they've been to, uh, this will be their ninth Super Bowl under Brady and Belichick. You know, they've won uh, five. But of the eight games they've played, they've been decided by an average of 4.2 points. And of the five wins, they've been decided by an average of 3.8 points. So this dominance is not reflected in the final scores. People forget that before this run by the Patriots, the Super Bowl usually was a dull, anticlimactic blowout. And the Patriots, they always make it interesting. The games often come down to the wire. You know, they're very fun games to watch. And people forget that the Super Bowl wasn't always like that. Mike Stanton is an associate professor of journalism at the University of Connecticut. He's uh, been an investigative reporter and a sports reporter in the region for a long time. He's also the author of Unbeaten, Rocky Marciano's Fight for Perfection in a Crooked World. Mike, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. My pleasure, John. Enjoy the Super Bowl. We've been spared the worst of winter weather so far this year, but a polar blast does make it hard to spend too much time outside. That is unless you're having fun on the ice. On the road, black ice can be deadly, but skim it across a lake, fast frozen with no snow? Well, that's the stuff of dreams for ice skaters. Ice skaters like New England Public Radio's Jill Kaufman. She's strapped on her skates to bring us the story of a perfectly frozen and fleeting moment. If you've lived in New England long enough, or Alaska for that matter, you know that ponds and open water freeze over differently year to year depending on the weather. Before that storm about 10 days ago, a few weeks of relatively dry and really cold weather aligned in western Massachusetts to create ponds that were frozen sheer, smooth like panes of glass for the first time in years. The skating was remarkable. The ice was so clear, every crack was visible and audible. This is on Lake Warner in North Hadley, Massachusetts. The sound can be scary, especially if you're out in the middle of a lake, alone, with a microphone. But some people can't help themselves. I was sitting here just the other night, and we heard one of those noises. 
Massachusetts state geologist Steve Maybe, skates on and hockey stick in hand, is one of the biggest kids out here on Metacomet Lake in Belchertown, Massachusetts. He made sure the entire UMass Geosciences Department knew how good the ice was, and some of them are also here. The sound ice makes is not only really neat, Maybe says. It's the same noise that you hear from the stormtroopers in Star Wars. Now, Water is sort of contrarian. First of all, maybe says, water is at its highest density when it's still liquid, at 4 degrees Celsius. And then... Water expands when it freezes. Most other materials are at their maximum density when they're solid, and they expand when they're heated. Think railroad tracks made of steel in the summer, maybe says. So when water hits 0 degrees Celsius, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it crystallizes, and the expansion makes the groans and that reverberating soundtrack. And this is a reassuring thing to hear when you're standing far from shore, a little nervous. A water molecule is polar. H2O has a slight positive charge on one end, a slight negative charge on the other. So that means it can attach itself to other water molecules. It's one of the few things that actually can be on the Earth in all three phases, solid, liquid, and vapor. And that's uh, kind of a cool property. No pun intended, but cool indeed. And on this day, perfection. A window into the bottom of the pond, at least at its edges, maybe, says... And he spent almost his entire life in the Northeast living next to water. When he was a kid, he says, he didn't get off the ice until his mother called him home. Ponds have thawed a bit and refroze. That perfectly smooth ice is gone for this season. The cracking, though, will go on. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Jill Kaufman. Go a bit further north, and it's easier to find a lake that's really frozen. And during the last weekend of January, hundreds of people walked out onto Lake Champlain in North Hero, Vermont, for the annual ice fishing festival. It's a day when the state allows people to drill into the ice and fish without a license. VPR's Bela Metzger bundled up to bring us this story. Have you been ice fishing before? Uh, First time. First time? Seven-and-a-half-year-old Henry Wozlowski is all bundled up in a hat and scarf. You can barely see his face. He watches his dad, Steve, do step one of ice fishing, drilling a hole through the ice. There are about 18 inches of ice under us today, and they say that's enough to hold a semi-trailer. The Wozlowskis are here with Cub Scout Pack 678 out of South Burlington. A group of boys and their parents came out to learn how to ice fish. Many are trying it for the first time. They're spread out over the frozen lake, making holes and dangling fishing lines below the surface. What are we doing once we get the hole here? What we're doing is jigging. What my son Henry here is doing is uh, basically let the uh, line go all the way to the bottom of the lake, and you sort of get the bait right up off the bottom, and then you kind of slowly wind it back up out of the ice, bouncing it as you go. And if you get a fish, real quickly pull them up out of the hole. For some people, when lakes freeze over, it means an end to spending time on the water until spring. For others, it's the start of fishing season. Lexi Boudreau sits with two friends. They look like they know what they're doing. They dragged out a sled piled high with supplies and big plastic bins. Old cat litter bins. (laughs) They work pretty good and they're free, so. Boudreau grew up in Milton and has been ice fishing since she was a little girl. So my dad taught me how to ice fish, but these two have never gone before, and I wanted to bring them along, and so it's their first time. Really, it's just about being with friends and doing something to get away from the hustle and bustle. Boudreaux's friend Jordan Ritter looks cold, but game. I haven't caught anything yet, but still hopeful. This is just a waiting game. You know, you play with the rod a little bit, bounce it up and down, and uh, hope a fish bites. Fish and Wildlife has set up a fry station so anyone who does catch a fish can eat it. Soon, Boudreaux and her friends leave their cat litter buckets behind and come over. Did you all catch anything? Yes, we caught a perch. It's about six inches big. Average for a perch, but too small for lunch. Still, she has them carve it up and throw it in the fryer. Very, very hot. Watch out. You guys want to try a piece? Mmm. What does it taste like? tastes like fried food. (laughs) But it's very fresh. It's not like when you go... A restaurant and get something frozen. It's soft, crunchy, and kind of salty. Mm-hmm. It's really good. After eating, they head back out onto the ice to do more fishing. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Bela Metzger. You can find our show wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Next New England. And if you like what you hear, be sure to rate and review us. You can also follow Next on Facebook and Twitter at Next New England. 
Our program is produced by Lily Tyson. Katie Talarski is the executive producer, and Carlos Mejia is the digital producer. We had help this week from James Baumgartner, Chris Albertine, and Andrew Perella. Thanks also to Peter Biello. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill, and you can hear more of his music at toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting with support from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York and the Melville Charitable Trust. It's powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, The Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and Connecticut Public Radio.